why the F-22 Raptor simply kills everything in the air. With Russia and China deploying advanced new fighters and surface-to-air missiles SAM, the task of gaining and maintaining air superiority over an increasingly more lethal battle space falls to a small and elite group of U.S. Air Force pilots flying the mighty Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor. Conceived during the waning years of the Cold War, the stealthy, high-flying, supersonically cruising Raptor was designed to defeat the most fearsome weapons the Soviet Union could hurl at the United States and NATO during a Third World War in Europe. However, with the end of the Cold War and subsequent 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union, the F-22 was left without a mission, or so it was thought. Indeed, the second Bush and Obama administrations canceled the F-22 program in 2008 after only 195 aircraft minus 187 production planes were ordered because they made the assumption that high-end state-on-state conflicts were a relic of the past. However, as it is becoming increasingly apparent, they were wrong. Earlier this year, Defense Secretary Ashton Carter spoke about a return to great power competition. We will be prepared for a high-end enemy. That's what we call full spectrum. In our budget, our plans, our capabilities, and our actions, we must demonstrate to potential foes that if they start a war, we have the capability to win. Because the force that can deter conflict must show that it can dominate a conflict, Carter said, speaking at the Washington Economic Club in February. In this context, Russia and China are our most stressing competitors. They have developed and are continuing to advance military systems that seek to threaten our advantages in specific areas. And in some case, they are developing weapons and ways of wars that seek to achieve their objectives rapidly before they hope we can respond. Indeed, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia protected the best of its military-industrial capabilities as much as it could during the economic and social meltdown of the 1990s. Despite its severe problems, Russia managed to develop and field advanced weapon systems such as the Su-35 S Flanker E, S-300 V4, and S-400 among others. Meanwhile, a rising China modernized its forces in earnest, developing new fighters and new SAM systems, such as the formidable J-16 and HQ-9. Thus, while Washington took its eyes off potential challengers to focus on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, leaders in Beijing and Moscow continued to modernize their militaries to keep American forces at bay in the event of a future conflict. Why America Needs the F-22 Raptor now, with voices on the left and the right clamoring for action in Syria, where the Kremlin is propping up its longtime ally, the Asif regime, the Pentagon finds that it has to rely on its tiny fleet of 186 F-22 Raptors if the call comes to establish a no-fly zone or a safe zone in that war-torn nation. The Raptor is the only operational combat aircraft that the United States operates that Washington can rely on to take on and defeat advanced air defenses such as the Panzer S-1, S-300 V-4, and S-400 that Moscow has dispatched to Syria. Moreover, it is the only aircraft in the U.S. Air Force inventory that possesses a huge performance overmatch against late-generation Russian fighters such as the Su-30 Staten Flanker H and Su-35 S Flanker E both of which the Kremlin has also deployed the region. Our role is to kick down the door. First Fighter Wing Commander, Colonel Pete Fessler, a veteran F-22 Raptor pilot, told me during a visit to Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, we are, without a doubt, on the leading edge of whatever force you're going to send because we have an airplane that has a capability that no one else has. Training matters. But while it is important to have the right tools, more important is the human dimension. Pilots and maintainers must be trained and ready to defeat the highest end threats if they are to be sent into combat. Recently, I visited the U.S. Air Force's Elite First Fighter Wing, a Vanguard unit flying the F-22 Raptor, during an operational readiness exercise. 
Unlike a large force exercise, such as Red Flag or the U.S. Air Force Weapons School's mission employment phase, which are focused on developing pilot skills, an operational readiness exercise is designed to test a unit's ability to deploy. It's essentially a dress rehearsal for going to war. The Raptor pilots, while they are a critical component, are still just one part of a team. Nothing is going to happen unless the maintainers can get the airplanes running. The ELO, low observable, maintainers can keep the skin healthy. The munitions guys can build the bombs and the missiles. And the weapons loader can get them on the airplane. The air traffic controllers can launch them. Intel folks can prep the pilots for the mission they are going to do. All those things have to come together. And if they get out of cinch, none of it works. Fessler told me as he showed me around the flight line. This exercise was designed to take us out of an in-garrison steady-state operation, rapidly mobilize, deploy, regenerate the aircraft, and then turn right into sustained combat employment. There is no other way to train to that. As Fessler explained to me, the idea behind the exercise was to take the six squadrons that make up the wing, plus personnel from the Virginia Air National Guard's 192 fighter wing and the supporting units and deploy them to a different part of the base while simulating austere conditions. For the purposes of the exercise, the wing was given prepared to deploy orders for a particular theater and told to get ready to leave with very little notice. Once ordered to deploy, the wing and its personnel then had to package all of the support equipment and configure their aircraft for that particular theater and then deploy it within a few hours. Indeed, during my visit, the wing's two F-22 squadrons had deployed to two different parts of the base and were operating out of tents on the flight line. It's very carefully orchestrated, Fessler said. The ultimate insurance policy. In many ways, the Raptor is the U.S. Air Force's insurance policy. While the rest of the Air Force has been preparing for and fighting low-intensity warfare scenarios, as an elite vanguard force, the Raptor fleet has focused almost exclusively on defeating the highest-end threats. We've been focused on the high-end threat all along, Fessler said. In fact, the departure from standard for us is the times we go over to OIR, Operation Inherent Resolve, the counter ISIS campaign, and do the close air support type missions over there. Low-intensity conflict is not our bread and butter. Even since the earliest days when the Raptor entered operational testing 2002, the F-22 has performed incredibly well in simulated combat, amassing lopsided victories in the air. Even when flying against the most challenging simulated threats, advanced Russian fighters such as the Su-35 and S-300 V-4 and S-400, it is exceedingly rare for an F-22 to be shot down. Losses in the F-22 are a rarity regardless of the threat we're training against, Fessler said. Why the Raptor dominates? Indeed, one of the problems for the F-22 is to generate enough targets and a tough enough threat so that pilots get some useful training. Another problem is that the jet is so capable in terms of its sheer speed, acceleration, stealth, sensors, and maneuverability. It actually compensates for tactical errors. A big upgrade and something needed? One recent addition to the Raptors at Langley is the new Block 3.2, a Slash Update 5 software. At long last, the new upgrade adds the Raytheon AIM-9 X-Sidewinder High Off Bore Sight Missile, something long coveted by the F-22 community. The additional of the A9X is a huge improvement for the Raptor, all of the pilots at first fighter wing that I spoke to told me. The addition of the new weapon greatly increases the F-22's already formidable lethality. That's even though Upgrade 5 is an interim capability. The A9X and the Raytheon AIM-100 and 20 DAM RAAM missiles will be fully integrated onto the Raptor with the Increment 3.2B upgrade which has yet to be fielded. The one thing that the F-22 is still lacking is a helmet-mounted queuing system HMCS, that would be used to exploit the outer edges of the A-9X's capabilities. 
It's a feature that is common on most U.S. fighter aircraft and most foreign ones. The lack of such a system would normally place the Raptor at a severe disadvantage in a dogfight if the aircraft didn't perform as well as it does. The Air Force is still planning on adding such a helmet-mounted queuing system to the F-22, but pilots at the first fighter wing say that it is not an absolute necessity. The Raptor can usually dominate a fight even without such a system. Indeed, as Fessler noted, even without the AIM-9X or a HMCS, F-22 pilots often close into gun range and ambush other jets in visual range. I can sneak up on a guy, Fessler said. In the F-22, I convert on guys, and they never even see you there. You roll up right behind them and go why waste a missile when you have a gun? Ultimately, as the U.S. Air Force's only dedicated fifth-generation air superiority fighter in an increasingly hostile world, where the threat grows more challenging every day, it is in the service's best interest to ensure the Raptor remains as capable as possible. Right now, the Air Force is slated to equip the F-22 with a helmet-mounted sight by 2020, but similar efforts have fallen prey to budget cut in the past. That helmet would be awesome to have. But it's not a game changer for us. Crash said. But a helmet mounted sight would help us a lot. 